Good evening, and I am Shuli Gibb. We are back for another conversation with Speak It. We are here to speak it with Michael Bland, the turnaround principal straight out of Compton. He has been doing some awesome work, and with the times we're in now, who better to share his story than Michael Bland? Now, we're letting you all come in and get your virtual seats. Come in, drop your city, tell us where you're from, say hi, share it, let people know that we're here and we are about to talk. It's important to have a conversation about education right now because education is a means where we can grow and we can turn some things around. So hi, we have Deshonda, she's here. She's saying hello to us all. We have Houston, Texas in the house. So again, you all come in and I'm gonna go ahead and tell you all a little bit about him. Michael Bland is a native of Compton, California. He was raised by his grandmother during the turbulent 1980s. Surrounded by drugs, gangs, and violence, he persevered and graduated high school. Mr. Bland went on to attend the Grambling State University where he received a bachelor's and master's degree in criminal justice. He also holds a master's degree from Lamar University in educational administration. From there, Mr. Bland worked as a probation officer in Los Angeles, where he influenced the lives of at-risk youth. He taught U.S. history for seven years at Lyles Middle School in Garland ISD. His tenure as assistant principal at Saxe High School was for a total of two years. From there, Mr. Bland went on to serve as a principal in Garland ISD at Coyle Middle School. During Mr. Bland's career in Garland ISD, he co-founded the MAC, I like that, the MAC um, Male Mentor Program to mentor and guide young men on a path of lifelong learning and college readiness. He is the former principal at the Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy in Dallas ISD. Mr. Bland is currently the principal at Lyles Middle School in Garland ISD. And beyond his educational work, he's, he's a husband and he's a father. He's married to Tamika Bland, who is a teacher also in Garland ISD. And he has a 17-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son who are also students in that district. Welcome, Principal Clark. I mean, let's get it. <laughs> let it begin. So we have Baton Rouge in the house. We have Grand Femme in the house and they're supporting you. But seriously, welcome, Michael Bled. Thank you. Thanks for having me this evening. You are very welcome. We had to have this conversation. We're going to get into it. So let's speak it. How did you make it out of Compton? We hear that, right? We see the people wearing the shirt straight out of Compton. It seemed like it was a cute thing. And you grew up in a time NWA was popping off. We had the L.A. riots. Tell us, how did you make it out of Compton? Yeah, you know, that's that's an interesting question. And it's not one that I haven't heard before. Obviously, Compton has a reputation. Uh, growing up in, in Compton was uh, a journey. And it was also a, a great time to, to be growing up in, in the 80s. And uh, Compton is my foundation. So there, every community has a sense of uh, family or a sense of uh, belonging, right? And so depending on the people that occupy that particular community, uh, they will gravitate towards whatever it is that brings them into unity. So when my grandmother moved to Compton, obviously it was the fact that they were upperly mobile and they were moving in from the South and it was a, it was, it was a, a paradise or utopia in a sense. But when I came around, obviously the gang culture was beginning to take shape and, and beginning to take over the city along with drugs and, and crime and all the rest. So my parents fell victim to that, obviously. Uh, my grandmother raised me, who, who was a registered nurse and she was a, a stickler for things like grammar and etiquette. Um, you know, she taught me everything that I know about uh, being a man in her form as a grandmother. And so I was more afraid of her than I was uh, the gang in my neighborhood. So, you know, growing, growing up around the Pyrus was, was uh, a rite of passage for some, but to me, it was off limits. But at the same time, those are my brothers too. And so were all the people in my neighborhood who weren't gang affiliated. So the way that I came, got around that to answer the question is, uh, it, it was the educators in my life, you know, on the school front. And it was the uh, the circle of you know of influence that I had in terms of family and friends in the neighborhood. So they saw something in me, 
and you know those my peers all the way up to the to the elders in the community and that's what pretty much kept me grounded was the fact that i knew i had a, a, a higher purpose and calling than just uh being part of the status quo shout yeah shout out to grandmothers and people who stand in the gap for us and educators and things like that and you went to grambling university tell me when you started your freshman year what was that like transitioning from LA, a certain culture, to Grambling State University? Right. Well, you know, quiet is kept. Com you know, Compton is country. You know, it was. <laughs> it was. I mean, it's in the middle of the city. It's inner city, Los Angeles. But at the same time, um, you know, my grandmother was from Houston, and so I was. You know, I, I knew about uh, all things culturally that related back to how they grew up. So, you know, I did all the things that she did growing up. I knew about gardening. I knew about. Uh, different different foods and, and, and barbecuing in the front yard and some of the other things that we were doing to uh, to build a sense of community. But at the same time, uh, coming from Compton and trans transitioning to Grambling in 1993 was just one year after the after the, uh, the Rodney King riots. And you know, I was I was young and impressionable in a good way, and I knew that there was a higher calling for me, like I mentioned earlier. And, and Grambling was going to be that place to catapult me into the position that I am now in now. Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about a higher calling and you're definitely, it seems like you're walking in that. And before we get into what that looked like for you to take that journey from Grambling to your current career path, what did that feel like for you at that time? Like you, you live this, you, this is not your, your first time. I remember watching it on TV in a little small town in Louisiana during right. that time, but that was, that was your home. That was your city. Because now it seems like George Floyd is the the new Rodney King. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Right. So you know, uh, the Rodney King video surfaced, and and you know, you had the Natasha Harlings uh, who was murdered by the by the store owner. You had various other atrocities taking place uh, in in the LAPD, the Compton PD, and all the sheriff's department in Los Angeles uh, had a history of police brutality. And so it was second nature to us to know how to interact with policemen. And we understood the rule of law, but we always understood, we also understood hood law. Mm -hmm. And so there were certain things that you would do and that, and, and that you wouldn't do uh, to antagonize the police. But at the same time, uh, it was a gift and a curse because although they had that stigma, there were also cops in our area who, uh, quote unquote, you know, were fair and decent people and treated us like human beings. And so you have that dynamic as well. Uh, but going to Grambling in 1993 and, and going to rural Louisiana was a culture shock nonetheless. Even though I can relate, um, it, it was just slow. And it, and, it, and, it was, and it was, the weather was different, the people were different. But it was almost like you hear people say that when they go to Africa and they say it felt like they went home. Yeah. And that's the same way I felt when I got to Grambling. It was, and we met, and I'm hearing some background. Do you hear background? I'm not sure on my end. Let me see something. I have some interference. Can you hear it on your end? I can, a little bit, just slightly. Okay, I'm not sure. We'll we'll keep going. I'll try to make the necessary adjustments. So we have Crystal Cooley that said, cultural shock indeed. Right, right. And just people chiming in, we know DRC. Hey, Shuli, what up, LB? And so we had a sense of community. We have Deshonda Coleman. She started Grambling in 1993. And so we're talking about, we had a sense of community. You're there, you learn to appreciate who you are. Now you've majored in criminal justice and right. you went from being a probation officer in, to teaching history. Tell us about, First of all, that, why, why criminal justice? Right, so the short story of the long story, uh, when I first got to Grambling, I was a nursing major. My grandmother was a nurse. I took nursing classes in high school and that was my first love, but uh, chemistry told me otherwise. And so uh, even though I had a sense of resilience and, and could get, you know, break through and, and, and fight through things, uh, those courses were getting to me. And plus the, the program was not in good shape at the time either. So I transitioned into some elective classes that I took in criminal justice, I said, hey, you know, this is something that I'm good at, something that I'm passionate about, something I understand, something I can relate to. And I knew that being proactive and going back to my neighborhood and bringing uh, uh, an understanding of law, bringing an understanding of, of, of policing and, and what that truly should look like, 
I felt that I could enact change that way more, you know, as opposed to complaining. Yeah, for sure. So you made yourself a part of the system. You went back and so you ended up mentoring you. That's something that you're passionate about. Then why the change to education? Right. So as a probation officer, I did that close to six years and I was a juvenile probation officer. I worked in facilities uh, from juvenile hall to some of the camps that are in, in Los Angeles. And then I also was a field uh, probation officer. And so uh, Los, Los Angeles County probation has over 5,000 employees. It's the largest uh, probation department in, in the world. And so it's multifaceted in terms of how you uh, approach a rehabilitation, if, you, if, that, if that's a word that we can say out loud. Uh, but the you re, family reunification, getting uh, yeah. the kids on the right path, you know, getting them introduced to education, allowing for them to find a pathway, exposing them to things that they weren't exposed to in their own neighborhoods was uh, what I found out my job actually had turned into. It wasn't just protecting the community, so to speak, but you protect the community when you give a kid options and you give them outlets. And so that was a, a, a clear awakening for me. And then, but what, one thing that I, I noticed is that um, our students, I'm sorry, our probationers were uh, thrilled to have a structured environment. They were thrilled to sit in class and not be harassed by their classmates or get into a, a, a scuffle, you know, with, with a rival game member. And so they, for the first time, were able to really sit and listen and understand what algebra was or, you know, history or whatever the, the discipline was. And so the underbelly of education is the education system and vice versa. And okay. they parallel one another in many ways. Okay. So, give me one second. Okay, guys, we're gonna do like a virtual commercial real quick. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to do some fixing here, and I'm not sure what's going on with this sound. Yeah, the, 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 is the feedback's not. It's not bad. Okay, good. All right, audience, and you let me know if it's getting in the way of you being able to hear. If not, we're going to keep going and we'll we'll push through it. So, so yeah, so you were saying that you you were seeing a difference with the students that were there. They were able to, like you said, learn. Right. There were no distractions for them in a sense is what I'm picking up on it. Right. And so tell me more because you were getting into before the sound interrupted. So you were saying that is it education is the underbelly of the criminal justice or the other way? Tell me your, your views on that. Yeah, so it's vice versa. We did something called a risk needs assessment with our probationers and it basically determines how often they uh, report to the probation department or it determines how they transition home or when they transition home or whatever the, the, the probationer situation was. And we would do our court reports and we would report back to the court uh, that, that probation is suitability to be reintegrated back into society. And so, um, we would ask them questions like, who was your favorite teacher? But they always had a favorite teacher. And, and most of these kids were dropping out in eighth and ninth grade. Uh, what was your favorite subject? They were able to tell me with, with precision, I like math. You know, what she dropped out in the eighth grade, but you can count money and you know how to break uh, product down and uh, mm -hmm. bag it and sell it. So uh, these were skill sets that these, that these individuals had, but they used it for uh, survival as opposed to uh, progression in life. So those are some of the things that, 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 that I saw. And so I'm like, wow, there's a correlation between criminality and lack of education. Indeed. And then how do you go to work to fix that? Did that shape something in you or, or cause a switch that changed the course of your career? Yeah. So, you know, I was able to unify families. I was able to, you know, integrate kids back into the system, but I was also sending kids to prison. Right. Yeah. So, and I was doing that more than I was the latter. And so with that in mind, I feel good about myself because I had a purpose for what I did and I was passionate about it. I understood uh, the system. And my thing is to work the system from the inside out to reform it. Right. But I moved to Dallas uh, in 2006 and I worked in Dallas for about six months in, in, in the criminal justice field. And the uh, the approach of the criminal justice system in the state of Texas was totally different than that of uh, California. California was based on re rehabilitation. Uh, Texas was based on punishment. And hmm. then there, was, there was variations of both, you know, but I'm just saying that was the, the main thing that I saw. And it was disproportionately affecting people of color in both arenas, but more so in, in, in Texas. And so uh, that prompted me to, to, to 
do a self-evaluation and really look within to say, where can I make a difference and, and, and have the most impact when it comes to uh, making the mark and, and, and putting people on the right path? And, and that light bulb just kind of went off. And I said, well, why not public education? I taught junior college before. I did that in California when I was a probation officer. I said, so, you know, why not uh, get to the root and be proactive and, and guide children through a curriculum and through a, a schoolhouse as opposed to uh, a probationary, you know, seat of conditions in a, in a jail. Yeah, indeed. And I've heard so much about that the school to prison pipeline, like the more I learn about this mm -hmm. and all of that. So the yeah. fact that you said, I'm going to step in, I can do something about it. Can you tell people what that's about? Um, and real quick, yes, Latoya Irvin, um, welcome. We are taking questions. So drop your questions in the box and we're going to talk through it. This is a conversation and we have an expert here. So let's talk about it. So yeah, tell the people about this school to prison pipeline and how all that works. So, you know, if you, if you just go back to, to the eighties and um, you can remember being in conflicts in school that resulted in a fist fight, somebody get the lip busted or there's some type of whatever that goes on, you get suspended. There's some, uh, there, there's some talking points between you and, and some principal or whatever the case may be, then you get, you go back to school. And if there's something egregious, you may have got kicked out, you may not, but you know, it, it was more of a, uh, the community policed children back then. Now, um, you know, things like truancy back then, you may have, you may have gotten some, uh, some penalties or some consequences for, being uh, excessively tardy or skipping school or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, you know, you're going before a, a magistrate and that judge has you and your parents, you know, uh, by the wallet and mom and dad are shelling out money if they have it. And if they don't, uh, there's a deficit there. Then there's monies, court fees, things that are old. And the student who is habitually late, uh, then is now introduced to the criminal justice system. And just based on that stigma of having to go to court, uh, gives them a badge of honor in some cases and then sometimes a badge of shame, but nonetheless, it has a, 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 a overwhelming negative effect on, the, on that student and, that, and those parents. And so, um, you know, we have, we have a draconian uh, education system when it comes to punishment, as well as on the on the criminal justice side, because the goal is to punish, not to reform, not to rehabilitate, not to expose, not to allow access and opportunity to do things, but to warehouse and place in jail. And so, I, I'm the, the school to prison pipeline is, is as simple as a kid who started out habitually late. Mom and dad may have some difficulties at home. Kid is angry at school. They fight at school. Uh, they never get any counseling services. And that turns into them falling in with the wrong group. And then you have this, uh, you know, trend of now the kid getting in trouble and being introduced to that system very early. And so the practitioners and the, and the uh, criminologists who sit back and, and, and forecast how many beds are going to be built for prisons for the next 20 years, they look at third and fourth grade test scores to see which students failed in a particular city and state. And that's where they project their bed numbers from. And they always undercut that number uh, because they need more beds than what they actually planned for. And, and you know, some would say that's by design, but nonetheless, that, that's a product of the system that I think is uh, it disproportionately affects black and brown kids. And so we're, that's that's the essence of the school to prison pipeline. Okay, and then as we get into more of systemic racism, because that's that's just what I'm hearing all throughout. All of this, we cannot deny where we are. Rest in peace, you know, George Floyd. They memorialized him today in Minnesota, and mm -hmm. people are outraged, and we have protests, and we have all of this stuff going on. And I'm seeing like layers upon layers upon layers of mm -hmm. things. And so we're we're here, and I believe that we're here for right. us to deal deal with this right now. So you're a history teacher. Tell us, like, what, what do we miss in history? We're talking about systemic racism. What do we miss as it related to that? And I'm saying we as America, the country mm -hmm. that, that has brought us here for those people who just might not understand. Yeah. So, you know, um, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's a heavy question, right? Yeah, so, for real. You know, you, you got, you, we would have to go back to the 1500s in the inception of the slavery system here in America and bringing, importing African people 
to this country for the for the purpose of propping up uh, the economic system for places like England, Spain, and and, and France. And so the uh, over proliferation of, of 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 individuals being placed into this country has um, caused this country to have a black eye, and that black eye has been covered up with all type of different makeup mm -hmm. and been called different names and. You know, you, and, and now today it, it, it's coming to a head because uh, people are tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. So the pink elephant in the room is no longer pink it, and, and no longer invisible. It's live and direct. That's an elephant, right? Yeah. And so, you know, obviously you, you've heard the cliche of, you know, you, you, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time? Mm -hmm. well, we, we've been doing that, but we're tired of taking small bites. You know, now it's time to, to, to kill the elephant. Let's do it. And how do we... How do we do it from the thing? You've seen it, you've grown, you, you're you on your path, you're making impact. In your opinion, what are some things that we can do? Yeah. So knowledge is power, right? Yeah. Uh, you have to know where, where, where you, 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 don't, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you came from. That's, that's first and foremost. And so we're talking about a people that were stripped of everything from their language to their culture, to their uh, way of life, their, their, their religions. And so on and so forth, and, and you bring them and you make them fit into a society that was not necessarily made for them as a citizen, but just a burden bearer. And so those type of individuals are going to take on the same behaviors as their oppressors. And so if we go back and look at the history of, of rioting in this country, our, our unrest, right? I mean, our country was uh, built on that. You know, if we if we look at uh, Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty and how they orchestrated the Boston Tea Party, which was a peaceful you know protest uh, that actually turned it was violent. There was there was the tar and feathering of of tax collectors. There was the uh, uh, defacing of property and things. You know, the, the, the those products were thrown into the sea. So there was an economic uh, loss to England. And so I, I bring that up to say that that was embraced by the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of people at that time, but that's because it disproportionately affected uh, them, the oppression I'm talking about from a tyrannical government, King George III in England. Correct. But right now when the people of this country are showing that same level of, of, of dissatisfaction with the current government and the current system, and you get this type of an outcry, you know, these people are being called everything but a child of God. And, and when I say these people, I'm talking about the people in our country that are, are dissatisfied with the way things are, are going. And uh, we know that all the metrics that are out there that to measure uh, criminality and, and any other uh, negative thing in our society, African-American and Hispanics lead in those categories. That's just, that's just a fact. Yeah. And so that we, we're, we're fighting against uh, uh, a lack of knowledge. We're fighting against a lack of representation in government. We're, we're, we're looking at a, a, a disproportionate uh, number of, of those that are affected through poverty. And poverty is not a it's not an economic state more than it is a mindset. So it doesn't matter if you're middle class and you've ascended from the ranks and you, you're now walking around with your, you know, uh, <laughs> your, your, your nice <laughs> clothes on and you, you grew up and suffer from the same atrocities as everybody else, and don't forget, right? So, though, but that that mindset is one that we've we've been ashamed of as a people, and uh, and it's caused us to fracture and, and be uh, not unified. And so, as a result, today we, we see that that uh, that same issue uh, of police brutality has placed all of the things that I just said back in the forefront of our lives and in in the, in the face of the world. Yeah. yeah. And we're here now. And and of course, we want to talk solutions. And like mm -hmm. you said, we got to get our mindsets right, get back mm -hmm. on track. And we have black educators that are out there. We need people to be empowered. We need to figure out some people say the system is broken and some people say, no, it's not. It's working for the people who created the system. So let's let's talk about how to fix it. And with that being said, Latoya mm -hmm. Irvin has a question. You are known as a turnaround principal. You are getting results. So what do you think makes you successful as a turnaround principal when so many others are failing? Yeah, well, one, you, you have to respect uh, those that you teach. And so giving, giving, empowering students is the first order of business before you can educate them. Uh, 
uh, giving a people a sense of self, giving them a, a level of pride, giving them a seat at the table, giving them a voice, and allowing for them in, uh, to, to build skill sets that they, they don't have and giving them opportunities and access to and exposure to things that they wouldn't necessarily see on a consistent basis, that's empowerment. Teaching them about financial literacy, that's empowerment. Taking their parents and uh, educating their parents on uh, the education system and what college truly is and how not to get caught up in the in the student loan trap and all these things that, that you, you empower people that way. But once you get past that hurdle, then you educate. And that means that you teach the curriculum, you assess the student and you have a continuous cycle of refinement and then you move that student on to a, a to be a lifelong learner and uh, to be college ready and career ready. OK, and then in the schools, what was your first opportunity to implement this plan? Because like right. you were at the Barack Obama, it was at the academy. And now mm -hmm. you're back where you started. Actually, you've come full circle. So kind of tell me what was that like implementing your plan? Yeah. So, um, you know, you. You, you, you plan your, you, you have to plan the plan first, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I remember as a teacher second year and I saw that, you know, all these reports that were coming out that talked about dropout rates and uh, students of color being placed in in-school suspension and out-of-school suspension at a higher rate than everybody else across the country and all that stuff. And so the students I had in my class and I taught history, which is a boring subject to some, uh, they were passionate about learning American uh, history. But I didn't teach American history. I taught history and I taught them where they fit into history. And so by giving them a, 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 an understanding and an identity in American society, which they never had before, um, so far as a teacher teaching them history, that was the first step. Second was um, I was an example for them. They saw me and they saw uh, excellence. They saw professionalism. They saw structure. They saw order. And they also saw someone that they could relate to that could um, take that same content and make it relevant to them, make, you know, give them a real world example of how that history is going to help them be better people long term. And so what I did is I, I started a male mentor program as a result, along with another gentleman by the name of Ralph Mills. And we call that, that program uh, the MAC program, Mentoring Achievement Through a Commitment to Knowledge. And so, you know, we were starting at the ground floor, give our kids uh, something to feel proud about start teaching them who they are as a people, show them their grand, the, the great history that they know nothing about prior to being slaves, um, make correlations between the plight of African-Americans and other minorities, take uh, disenfranch you know, disenfranchised whites and poor whites, and then those of affluence in all races and, and, and show them where they all uh, have a commonality, which is to live in harmony with one another and respect one another in their lifestyle. So that was my first way of, really introducing and, and, and putting things in place uh, on a school level, from a system okay. level, to really enact change. Okay, and then of course, I see the comments are, are really, really going right here. And I have a follow-up question. So you started with, with the MAC program, and then I'm hearing Crystal Cooley, she's echoing the causes of poverty um, is associated with lack of education, illiteracy, epidemic diseases. These trends must change. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that as it relates to your programs and the empowerment process? Yeah. So, you know, if, if you go back and look at the plight of the African-American student, right, and start uh, during Reconstruction post-slavery, I'm mean, sorry, yeah, post-slavery. And so that, seven, that 12 years that we call Reconstruction, um, you know, we, we began to have the Freedmen's Bureau who brought about the creation of African-American uh, colleges that we have today and schools from you know, pre-K through uh, college. And so as a result of that, uh, there was a lot of upward mobility from a, from a group of people who that were, that were slaves uh, just a year prior to that. And then all of a sudden in a 12 year period, we have senators. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there was never a, a, an achievement. Uh, and I don't, I don't wanna say there was an achievement gap, but it was that there was never an equity gap. You know, I mean, or, or not, an opportunity for, for those, uh, a student to actually of color to actually be educated. It was against the law. You were killed for learning to read and write. And so that tells you how um, uh, intelligent we were, right? Mm -hmm. so then you fast forward to Jim Crow, which replaced uh, Reconstruction, and you had another 100 years of oppression. And then you move into Brown versus Board of Education, and you move into the Civil Rights Act, and then the Voting Rights Act in the 60s. Um, 
and then integration is. And then, you know, if you look at the trends and, and, and look at student achievement for African-American students, uh, it ebbed and flowed, but it was very steady and students were achieving at the same levels as their, their white counterparts. But um, when you put someone in a situation where uh, they're not valued, then that education becomes substandard because the, the teacher that's teaching that particular student doesn't value who, who sits in front of them. So then talk about the importance of teachers who look like the students that they serve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know great teachers that are, that are black, that are, that, are, that are white, that are of all ethnicities, and uh, there's some great educators out there. And the, the, the great ones, like I said, they empower but those uh, mediocre ones and those that just do because they can't do something else and they teach, yeah. well, yeah. They, they educate. And that may be a good education or maybe substandard. So you kind of, it's a crapshoot. And so if we look at our, our, our large cities, our urban cities that, that are made up uh, heavily of minorities, we see a lot of that, those inequities wearing their heads, but we also see it in the suburbs. We also see it in rural areas when it comes to those achievement gaps. So. Um, Really now, you know, as, as an educator, we have to rethink how we educate students. I mean, is it going to be the sage on the stage and you just profess knowledge and the student just takes it all in? Or are we going to make it a more student centered environment that's tailor made for that particular student? And what are you seeing at your schools like when you're changing up things? Yeah, so I first start out with holistic. I mean, I have a, I take a holistic uh, approach to developing students. And so. Mm -hmm taking a student and giving them, uh, making sure that their needs are met, that they're eating, that their their clothes are cleaned, that they're getting haircuts, they're hygienically sound, they're getting seen by the nurse, and if they need glasses, they're getting glasses, so on and so forth. You, got, you have to meet those needs first. Your All kids love structure. So then you have to go in and make sure that uh, you're, you're the, on top of the social and emotional needs of that student, you're also meeting uh, the academic, academic needs of those students. And so you have to uh, tailor your, your instruction and the curriculum to fit the culture of the students that you teach. That doesn't mean that you have to go in and dumb the, the curriculum down, because that's, that's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you have to make it relevant. Indeed. Now, what about the parents? Latoya Irvin wants to know, most parents didn't even know their students weren't attending virtual learning. How do you get parents involved when they seem disinterested or have conflicting work schedules? In terms of a virtual environment? Yeah, so we're talking about the kids. Now let's talk about the parents real quick. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a misnomer out that minority parents don't value education. That's an untruth. What it is is that uh, society dictates you know, our time and where we put our, and how we prioritize our time. And so you know, if, if you have to work two jobs, and you're off one day a week, and that's Sunday, and you go to church on Sunday, well, throw homework in there somewhere. Where's, where is that gonna fall on the, on, the, on the list of priorities for that parent? Um, you know, if the kid is a good kid, the kid is self-sufficient and stays out of trouble, and they're out of sight, out of mind, if they come home with all Bs and one C, I mean, that's success to a parent, you know, who, who can't necessarily lend their time to, to do those type of things. And then you have, on the flip side of that, um, you, you have you have to bring parents in and, and get them and make them a viable part of the school community. They have to have a voice. So all your your uh, campus improvement plan, I mean uh, uh, teams, your uh, site based decision making teams, and uh, your PTAs, and all these groups uh, is the way that you empower empower them by giving them knowledge and giving them a voice and, and having them part of the decision making on the campus, whether it be policy procedure or something as simple as a school dance. So we say we're having studies show that black students who see teachers who look like them are more likely to enroll in college. So that's mm -hmm. in response to your previous comment. So mm -hmm. then when it comes to parents, are you finding that, like you said, all parents are not disengaged from the learning process? Mm -hmm. What in the schools that you've seen, what is the worst case scenario when you have the worst kind of parenting, the parent that comes in and you're trying to educate the child, you have all of these factors that are going on and you have poverty and that you need to meet the needs of the child, but then something happens and then there's a disciplinary action that you have to take and then the parent that comes to the school, what do you say and how do you handle those kind of things that where the parents you know, might give you a hard time, but you're really trying to help the child? Yeah, so the parents are basing their perception of that school on their experiences. 
So for your parents, and, and if we're talking about in the inner cities or in the hood, whatever you want to categorize it, when you have a parent that went through a school system that didn't care about them and they, and they were treated the same way as they perceive their kids to be treated, then they're going to have a distrust for those that sit before them and call themselves educators. The educator is no different from, from the probation officer or the policeman or the, or the judge uh, that they have run-ins with throughout their lives. And so one way to break down that barrier is uh, by, by making sure that, the, that they understand that school is a system and that the system is made up of different people and different personalities and all the rest. And when you partner and you have a say, then it breaks down those barriers and everybody comes in as equals. I mean, I'm the principal of a campus. Everybody knows that. But when I walk around my campus, I'm, I'm part of the school community just like anyone else. There's no hierarchy in terms of that. So uh, giving, giving a kid a sense of self is one thing, but you also have to do the same thing for the parents. So we have to empathize and, and show a level of compassion for those, those parent situations. But that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that we don't hold them accountable and compromise either. It means that we empower them just as well as we empower their, their kids. Okay, that's good. So, well, first I'll go back to our first comment. Unika Colbert says, keep the focus on the child and get get police out of school, counselor, not cops. Gotcha. So, you know, the, the, the SRO, the school resource officer, and in some cases, mm -hmm. you know, districts have their own uh, forces. And then in, in other cases, we, like ours, we have a, an actual peace officer for the city who's on our campus. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are pros and cons to that, but I'll say this: when that police officer understands what community policing is, when they when they understand uh, diversity and inclusion, and they see that uh, that campus and that neighborhood and those parents and those students uh, as part of their uh, as part of who they are, and there's there's a there's a commonality among them from a human standpoint. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what sets uh, a cop apart from a community partner, if that makes sense. If, if they're just a cop, then, you know, I'm going to do everything that I do when I'm on the streets. I'm going to hide stuff and I'm going to, you know, uh, politic and, you know, I'm, I may do some things to make sure that he's on my side or not. Or I may want to show him straight up. I don't, I don't value and, and respect you. But on the flip side, if that, if, that, if that cop is a community partner, then that's somebody that you go to to get advice. That's someone that you go to sometime when you're hungry and you get to school second period. And you haven't eaten in a day, and he gives you a, a pack of crackers. I mean, he, he's no longer the, the cop. He, he, you know, you don't see him as a pig. You don't see him as a, as one time or as some type of, uh, you know, whatever moniker you want to place in him. You see them as someone that is again looking out for their best interest. And kids are impressionable. So they, so, so the that that community policing model is one that we have to start to embrace, and we won't have these uprisings and things like that when both parties see one another as equals and, and they can respect each other. Indeed. Okay, Deshonda Coleman, okay. She is speaking on it, so we have something. That's a paragraph. That Go is ahead. a paragraph, she has covered our faces, but we're about to read this and you're, we're gonna talk about it because we're here to have a conversation. I agree with you about um, customizing the curriculum. In Louisiana, our lower performing public schools don't have the flexibility of customizing the curriculum to meet the needs of the students. Unfortunately, the curriculum doesn't meet the educational needs of, of our students. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to turn a school around without having the flexibility to make the changes you need to soundly educate the students? That's one, part one. And if so, please advise on how you were able to make it happen. So turn around without the flexibility to make the changes you need. Right, so you know, um, I'm a calculated risk taker. Does that make sense? Um, I'm going to do things within the rules, but I'm going to I'm going to also think outside the box. In fact, not just thinking outside the box, but blow up the box. And uh, there, there's a gentleman that, that I've, I've met in recent years. His name is Gabe Meadows, and he had a philosophy um, that he that he lived by in terms of working with at risk youth. Um, and he said, "You got to make deals, right?" And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, you got to make deals. That's what I ain't about to compromise and, and, and set low expectations and all that stuff. He, he says, no, not that. He says, it's an acronym. And I said, what do you mean? What, what's the acronym? He said, make deals, discipline, education, affirmation, leadership, and security. Right. And I heard that and we were, we were working on a, on a project and, and I said, can I borrow that? You know, because, you know, educators beg, borrow and steal. Right. <laughs> um, so I've been, I've been, I've been, I'm using that even currently now. And, and I've worked with my, with my, uh, 
my teachers and I tell them like, we got, we can't just think outside the box. We got to blow the box up. Right. And you can't worry about the consequence of making a mistake. You know, I'll, I'll ask for, for grace later. I'll make the mistake first, as long as I know it's in the best interest of kids. Yeah. So, so you have to be bold first and, and be able to be a risk taker. The other thing is to be innovative um, and, and, and transformative in, in, in your approach to education. So um, case in point, we don't have lockers on, on our campus. And it's because of the technological revolution. Kids have tablets, they have phones and smartphones. Uh, they don't carry around books like we did. And so why not sit, you know, we sit back and say, well, they don't, they don't read books anymore, you know, but, but they're reading their tablet, words are words, right? And uh, so, so taking that approach and being able to take all those antiquated views and thoughts and things about how I did it and start looking at a fresh, having a fresh perspective, that's another way of, of, of doing that. Now, so far as the curriculum, modifying the curriculum, yeah, you can't, you may not be able to go in and write your exams or in some cases, or you may not be able to uh, uh, take, take the curriculum and say, you know, I'm not gonna teach this particular part of it. But nobody stops you from using your skills and, and, and what you bring to the table, the art of teaching, and you being able to go in and using that to, to differentiate the instruction. And not just for a student that is in special education or 504 students or a student with a disability, but for all students or an ESL student, or e, we call them ELs now, but our EL student. I mean, you, you have to teach teach all those kids in a different way, but at the same time, it's your obligation to make sure that they understand it and that they value mm -hmm. it and, and, and they uh, see some uh, relatability in, in that particular discipline that they can add value to their lives. So that's the other thing, just being able to think outside the box and, and blowing that box up, but replacing it with another box, right? Okay. And that box may not be square, it may be round. You know, whatever you got to do to fit the needs of those students, you, you need to find a way to do it. So you can't wait for someone to give you permission. You just got to take it and, 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 and take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and just do it. Okay. Latoya Irvin said, run that acronym back. <laughs> right. So it's make, make deals. So it, it stands for discipline, education, affirmation, leadership or love, interchangeable, uh, and support and security, which is also interchangeable. And so... Uh, we're talking about holistic child development. So when you give a kid those pillars of support, um, that's it. I mean, that kid is going to buy into you and everything that you put out there, good, bad, or indifferent, because that's why our kids join games, right? Mm -hmm. That's why our kids, what they want to go through a rite of passage. They want to they get to a, a sense of belonging with a group of people that they have a common uh, understanding and, 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 you know, with and, and a common culture. Well, Take that and flip it on the other side. That's what a football team does. That's what uh, any sports, you know, team does. That's what organizations do. You know, Google, uh, Apple, they all have to follow that same philosophy. So we have to take that and make sure that we're doing the same thing for kids. That's good. So back to the games and how, how students interact with each other. So how do you change the culture of how students interact with each other, such as the name calling, play fighting that turns into real fighting? How do you handle those type things? Yeah, so you have to be an example. You know, you 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 have to set standards. You have to hold kids accountable. Now, here's the other part of that. You have to be the standard. So you got to walk the walk. You know, you just can't talk it. You got you have to be the example. So if I'm telling the kids, because on on our campus they have uh, on Monday Monday through Thursdays for seventh and eighth graders, they're wearing blazers, Oxford shirts, ties, so on and so forth. Not everybody, but I mean that's the goal. Dress shoes. So if I'm not dressed the same way during that time, then how are they going to take that, you know, and internalize it and say, I'm going to do it. You're, you're telling us that it makes you, if you look good, you play good, like Dion said, or, you know, if, if, if this is this is what professionals this is, look like, or you feel good when you put on a suit, but I don't wear one, you know? So being the example, the other thing is uh, meaning what you say and saying what you, you know, doing what you say, if that makes sense. Um, if I say I'm going to do it, you know, I, I need to do it. You, yeah. can't, you can't disappoint kids. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, if I tell them if, if I see one more tardy, y'all not having this dance on Friday, and I see one more tardy, they better not have the dance on Friday. You know, I mean, not, you know, that that's 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 a whole nother conversation, but you get my point. Being consistent and also backing up what it is that you say. So kids will conform to those that they have respect for, not who they like all the time and not who they value uh, in terms of, of being like them, but the, the person that gives them consistency. Okay. I don't have a question right now. I have a comment. Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark. That's all I 
I thought I was saying. So Laura right. Hastings said, facts, parents have to be disciplined in order for the kids to have or accept discipline. And then Rocky Road said accountability. Mm -hmm. And then what about what about those those students or I mean not students, faculty or administrators who mm -hmm. are just too afraid to take the risk? What do you have to say to them? Because as black educators, would you say that we have a responsibility to engage our students and to guide them through when we see that things are lacking, say we're in a system that doesn't have a policy in place? What do you say about those who are afraid to take the risk? Yeah, so, you know, and, and that transcends color and culture because, yeah. you know, black teachers and white teachers alike, are, you know, fall into that category from time to time. Um, you know, uh, here's the thing. It, on, on, on my campus, if you can't conform to the expectations that I set. Uh, if you don't believe in the children that we teach, if you don't uh, buy into the system and the culture of the campus, if you're not adding value, we have a 13 uh, point uh, teacher leader profile. So when I'm when we hire teachers, we're, we're vetting them based on that 13 step profile, right? And so we ask them questions about how, how do you handle stress? You know, when, when you were in school, uh, what adverse childhood experiences can you remember that um, caused you not to have a good experience? And the reason we ask things like that is because when that teacher gets in front of kids, kids are good at pressing buttons, right? So they're going to look at you. They're going to size you up. You got a big nose or, you know, you, you, whatever the case is, they go find out wherever your soft spot is. And that's what they're going to attack, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we have to equip them to say that whatever, whatever you know, you, you might have got bullied in the school. So there's a kid that makes you remember who that bully was and you remember that feeling you had. And that's the kid that certain teachers will. And it's called an unconscious or implicit bias. Right. And so they'll go in and just, you know, work with that kid at a minimum. And as soon as that kid acts out, they're responding the same way they did when they were kids. Right. So you got to kill that from within first. And so that means your professional developments have to be very. Uh, uh, it has, has to have to be direct and centered on uh, looking at ways to overcome those biases. Um, we have to talk about and have courageous conversations about race, about uh, culture, about uh, ethnicity, because they're all different. We have to, we have to also talk about uh, thing, things like wealth, our, our wealth gaps. So we have, to, we have to talk about economic empowerment. We have to talk about all the things that plague our communities in order to actually overcome those things in, in, in a school setting. Oh, I love that. Okay. Deshonda Coleman said, okay, send me those interview questions. <laughs> and I love the fact that you're having these conversations in your school. And another thing, let's talk about your philosophy. So what is the philosophy that's guiding that? I've heard you talk about solidarity. Mm -hmm. Well, so I, so I have a, so I have a theme that I've had on every campus and it's, and it's solidarity in the face of adversity for a common cause, right? And that's for the kids and the adults. If everybody's on one accord and you have a, a functional school community where everybody is working together, that's one thing. The adversity is going to come, whether it be an achievement gap, whether it be a pandemic, whether it, whether it's a, a, a civil unrest or, you know, God forbid, but, you know, suicide and mental health issues, th things like that are, are plaguing our schools as well. But that's going to come. But the way to overcome that is to have a common goal. So what is our common goal? To educate not just black kids, or brown kids, or white kids, or Asian kids, but all kids, right? At the same level and give them a fair and equitable and free education that's going to, again, uh, equip them to be better people in the long run. That's the first thing. Not just teaching to pass the test, right? Not just, not just teaching them standards to say that, oh, you've mastered uh, your Algebra 1 test, and so now you can move on to the next level. That's one thing. But what's the history of Algebra? Where did it come from? Why is it called algebra? You know, understanding that that's tied to a group of people and, and, and understanding, understanding the origins of what you're being taught goes a long way, right? That's where you get your engineers from. You know, who built the pyramids? Well, that's, that's you know, we could get into that, but did they use mathematical principles and ideals that we don't necessarily know today? Well, if you teach the history of that, then again, or you teach them the, the basics or the foundation, that's gonna help that student move forward and be more adaptable um, when it comes to them being members of functional members of society. I love this. It's one of those things where we need more schools like this. So what do we do? <laughs> 
MacArthur Baker. Yes, this is what he says. <laughs> All right. Okay, but um, we need more schools like this. What should the future looks like? We've, we've come from COVID, we're in, in the midst of two pandemics, right? We have a racial pandemic and we right. have COVID, which has let us know where the breakdowns are, the things that we need to fix. Then what does that look like? What does next year look like? How do we even move forward <laughs> with all this principle? Right. Turn us around. That. <laughs> right. And see, and, and, and so that's a lot, that's a lot of responsibility on one man's shoulders, right? Um, you know, what will school look like next year? We're, we're, right now we're being proactive and we're uh, putting together a scenario that, uh, I'm sorry, a system that will fit three different scenarios. A face-to-face -face model, uh, a blended learning model where you have um, a variation of schools, I mean, I'm sorry, of students who, who may attend for a certain amount of time and others are off and then a face-to-face -face, this brick and mortar regular school year. Uh, the CDC and the government and all the rest, they're, they're the ones that are gonna make those decisions, but we have to be able to work outside of the fact that we're going through all this and, and find proactive ways to really meet the needs of students. So students have been out of school close to three months without any instruction. Well, that's not true, but, but you know what I mean? They've been out of school close to three months, but they've gotten a virtual in, uh, level of instruction. Um, so we're gonna have to go back and close gaps and continue to, get students to meet their expectations in terms of being on grade level and making one year's adequate growth, despite the fact that we have these things going on. So the first order of business is uh, being able to provide and meet the needs of those students outside of academics, right? We know we've had uh, students who have lost family members. We have students who them themselves have been harmed or, or, or you know, whether it be uh, domestic violence or child abuse in some cases. Um, hunger and all these things that have been going on um, are just straight up apathy. Like, I don't care, you know, about what we got going on right now in school. So we have to find a way to really change our school's focus so that those kids come back and they're excited about being at school. Um, what would make them excited? Well, one is making sure that that we're treating them in a way that that that's student centered, meaning that we're looking at the kids needs and letting the kids help in the decision making. Right. Uh, help making sure that they have a voice in the classroom and they're not just sitting behind a desk and listening. Two, uh, we have to empower the community. And the community has to understand is that where we, we have good schools, you have good communities. See, the, the schools place a lot of pressure on the community. Uh, you know, when I call mama and I say, you know, your kid hadn't been to school in two weeks, and, you know, the, the normal call they would get is that we're going to file for truancy at, at some point. But when we call, what can we do to assist you? You know, what, what is it that's causing you not to, not to for, for, the, for your son or daughter not to be able to come to school? And so when you get to the root cause of the issue, um, that that's that's where that relationship starts to build between the school and the community. And, and this is that the place has a safe haven as opposed to just uh, another building. The other thing is, is, is putting strong community. I'm sorry, strong um, partnerships with businesses and other entities like your Toyotas, your State Farms and other groups that are out there that, are, that, that have a philanthropic approach to education, who wanna put money and time and manpower into the schools and really give our kids uh, a leg up on corporate America and how that works or the economic system or whatever it may be. And so those are some things that, that we can do on the surface, but it takes a certain type of leader to do that. You have to be someone that is, that's forward thinking and proactive um, in the way that they approach the job. And, and they don't just see it as a job, but they see it as a way of life. Okay, somebody, I think somebody is trying to post a question. Um, mm -hmm. this, may, this reminds me, she's trying to get her to post here. I had a conversation, I have a group called Fear to Freedom and I have it where people can come in and mm -hmm. overcome their fears, walk in their freedom, walk in their purpose and that kind of thing. And we had an educator in our group and we've been talking about hats, hard ass conversations, which is why why you're here this is a hard right. conversation about where we are about education in the light of everything on the you know with the backdrop of everything that's going on in our world right. and we had a student who i mean a, a teacher who is at a predominantly white school she doesn't feel supported she fought to get a black history program just really trying to help children with the mindset show them the love all some of the qualities that you're talking about and be a representative, but she's not feeling supported on her campus. What advice mm -hmm. would you have?
for an educator who wants to do this and they, they want to be there and they want to teach to the whole child or they want to make sure that they know their history and have all of that going. But yep, how do they how do they do that? How do they get support? Yeah, for one, um, if you if you can't find the, the, the support from within, then you look outside. There are groups of or, or organizations that exist here in the state of Texas that can help them with, with, with that. One is the Texas Alliance of Black School Educators uh, on, on the state level. Then you have on the on the national level, the National Association of Black School Educators. And that's just two groups. Um, you know, you have a bunch of other groups that are out there ranging from the NAACP, the Urban League and various other uh, groups that can come in and help add value to your schools through community partnerships. That's what that's why I say that's very important. So if you can have that support from within, find it without. Two, uh, again, don't be afraid to blow up the box. You know, if, if when you're in your classroom and you're teaching, you're in control of the learning in that classroom, not your principal, not those that are around. And, and so your students in your classroom are only as good as how you teach them. And so if, if you find a way that to grab and, 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 and hold of those students and, and really shape who you want them to be, it's, it's a by any means necessary approach. You can't allow for a, a rule or, or, or a person or someone that doesn't have the student's best interest to stop you from doing your job. You're obligated as an educator to educate. Nobody can uh, hold you accountable for doing the right things for kids. So if you're not hurting kids and you're adding value, then by all means, continue to do that. But then also partner with people from around your district and around your area, around your state, and just the country as, as a whole that have the same growth mindset that you have. And if that, if that growth mindset exists, um, then you become a change agent in your own environment. You know, you, you, can't, be, you can't be scared to death and, and, and make change. Uh, you can't sit back on your hands and, and worry about the consequences of your actions more than you should worry about whether or not you're doing your job at the best level that you can do. So you have to prioritize within self to say, Am I, am I a man or woman of principle or I'm a man and woman of fear? Okay. So when it comes to the hard conversations, thank you for all of that and all of the advice and the feedback. Mm -hmm. But we, we're getting ready to close out. Mm -hmm. I knew this conversation was going to take longer than 30 minutes. I think there's so much to say on the topic. Right. Um, right. How has it been for you? Like, how are you? What is that like? You're leading during a tough time. What is the mental state of a leader during a time like this? And how have you navigated that? Right. So, you know, this is a time for self-reflection. Um, being at home and, and, and confined to, you know, your, your, your house and, and the things that you uh, do on a daily basis, you, you develop routines and all the rest. Um, I, you, you have to find a way to reinvent yourself, right? Uh, I tell my teachers all the time that self-care is the first order of business for them. You know, uh, we in education, we have something called a mental health day, just like you do in other, in other professions. You know, you didn't work, you know, full six weeks and then another full six weeks and you just kind of burned out and you got to take that Monday off or that whatever day off. Um, sometimes you got to do that just to come back to the drawing board and fight, fight the good fight. Um, I don't necessarily have the luxury of doing that, but what I do have the luxury of doing is going back in and, 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 and redefining and reinventing myself every day so that when I come out, I have a fresh and new perspective on what, how I'm gonna lead that campus. The things that work for me, you know, I keep them in place and those that I need to, to work on and tweak, those are the refinements that I make. And again, being bold and taking chances and, and calculated risk in order to do what's best for children is the other, the other thing to do. So you, it's really it's really about uh, the individual finding that intrinsic motivation and drive that's going to really push them to do some things that are are hard or that are uncommon uh, to get an uncommon result, which is to reach a group of kids that may be harder to reach than, than the average. And so uh, this pandemic has allowed now for the light to be sh sh shine on, sh on, on on education and educators. Uh, you, you've seen the memes and you've seen some of the, the, the things that are out there about Man, I can't wait for these kids to go back to school. Where y'all at? You know, or I can, you know, y'all got 30 things at one time and I just got my two right here, you know. Um, and then I got to teach them how to learn something that I don't know in a way that, you know, you, 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 you teach an addition inside of some boxes. What's, well, you know, what part of the game is that? So, again, now that there's some value being added back to the profession and educators themselves have figured out, oh, I, I do. I, I am. Uh, a contributing member of society that has a uh, something fun, you know, skill set that someone else doesn't have. I'm a professional, so that's the other thing, you know, really uh, 
being proud of and, and who you are as an educator and, and knowing that you're changing lives despite uh, the days that you feel like you're not. Uh, finding the finding the, cla the glass being half full is the key, you know, because you can always find the empty side of it. Yeah, it is empty. But what are you doing to fill it up? You know, are, are you are you the one that because you, 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 you know you're the one pouring the water, you know what I'm saying? So you just go pour the glass mm -hmm. half full. So it's the, it's the time and the and effort that you put into what it is that you feel uh, will make those kids successful. <laughs> MacArthur Baker said, "Just carry the one that works every time." <laughs> <laughs> So definitely you're taking care of yourself as we, we get ready to close up one quick question and you can do this. This is like lightning round. Mm. Um, should we open our own schools? Yes. Okay. Tell us about that real quick, the importance um, of it and uh, how can we do it? And we can continue the conversation in a group or something later on, but yeah. Yeah. So there's, so there, so there are, there's funding out there. Um, you know, whether, it, whether it is charter uh, schools or private schools or parochial schools, uh, you know, there, there's 106 HBCU campuses on the higher, you know, ed side, um, and then there's private campuses on the on the pre K through 12 as well. Um, but coming up with a viable system that takes students of color and, and put them in positions of, uh, you know, for them to do well and and, and for them to thrive, uh, that's imperative. I mean, it, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not discriminatory. It's not um, you being uh, uh, racist to do something like that. But what it is, is it, it, it's you being smart and, and, and doing something that is best for children, right? So, um, you know, communities of color have to hold campuses accountable too. And when you hold campuses accountable, and if that, you don't necessarily have to go in and have a, a, a private school where minority kids go. If they go to the public schools, that mean you get into the profession and you teach at that private school and you go into administration and you, be, you get a seat at the table to be able to make that change happen and you have your own schools within the public school system. So it's not necessarily about um, a total and complete break and separation from the public school system. It's about holding that system accountable and then redefining it and reshaping it into what it should be. Um, but self, self, being self-reliant and independent is, uh, should be the first rule of law, you know, in, for any man, you know, to be, to, and I think that's something that, that, that we're moving back to as a community. Um, but yes, ma'am. That, that's how you first. You know, wh where's the money at? You know, go 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 out here and look at these celebrities who, who and, and and billionaires and, and and our communities pool their resources and put your dollars back into your own communities. Two trillion dollars a year we spend as African Americans in this country. You can't tell me we can't have our own campuses and our own communities and our own hospitals and our own whatever. Um, and now, when I say our own, I'm saying owned by and ran by, but also um, being inclusive and, 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 and others in the community, if you want to move into that area, to move in. I'm just saying that it's ran by these particular people. Okay, what does that school look like? The school by us for us, the FUBU school, for us, by us. Right, what right, does right. It look like? I, I think it looks like any, any typical school where best practices are the order of the day. Um, you know, it doesn't matter the color, ethnicity, or who's actually running the campus more than it does about the actions that take place and how consistent those actions are. And so th those campuses are ones where uh, the curriculum is tailor-made for the individual child. It's one where the educator, um, you know, it, it is teaching tolerance and, and inclusion on top of the curriculum, uh, where, where, the, where they're respecters of, of culture and identity, and uh, where discipline is discipline and not punishment, uh, where, where it's a, a, a teaching tool for kids to understand what pro-social behavior looks like over anti-social behavior. Um, so those schools are, are, are not far-fetched. We have examples of those schools. I, as principal of the Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy, that's the, the closest that I've seen to a utopian education system uh, being on that campus. And what it starts with is a mission and a vision that's being not only articulated verbally, but also in action. So when we say we develop men into impactful leaders on that campus, um, that's what we do. It's an all-male academy, and, that, and that's the goal, is to send them out better than which they came, right? Uh, but we have to be mission-driven and role-bound as well. And so that, those campuses are, are, are on the come up, if that makes sense. But it depends on the person that's leading those campuses. 
Okay. <laughs> I think we better get ready to shut it down. Yeah. Um, if they want to continue this conversation, Rocky Road said, Michael Bland, you rock. Thank you and Shuli for the conversation yes. tonight. I'm glad to be here to start the conversation. Um, we're in the midst, America's in the middle of a hard ass conversation, a hack mm -hmm. on, on race. And right. it's important that we talk about education during this time. We needed to talk about it, but we, we need it to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, Latoya Irvin wants to know real quick, what other schools in DFW have similar ideals as your campus? Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's many leaders out there that are doing great work um, from Dallas ISD to, um, you know, some of your far reaching suburban camp, uh, districts. And so, you know, as, as we meet together as principals, we exchange best practices. Uh, we, we are also um, inclusive in terms of not just sharing best practices, but then also supporting one another and making sure that uh, our communities, are, are, their needs are being met through the school themselves. And so to, to answer that question, I mean, I could just go on and on about various campuses, but um, if anyone needs more information about what that looks like and, and, and where those campuses are located in the DFW area, uh, by all means, reach out to me. Okay. All right. And then lastly, what is it that you need? And is there any level of support that we can provide you being resources, community partners? How can we as a community help you in your mission? And we have other people out there, but specifically, how can we help you in this moment? Right. So um, any organization, person, uh, philanthropic organ or organization or whatever it may be, uh, it's just a matter of giving them my cell phone number and my email address. Okay. Uh, and then it becomes a conversation. What I do on a consistent basis is tour people around our campus. I like them to, to, to come in and get a feel for what it is that we do on the campus. Mm -hmm. and, after, and after that tour, um, I can talk to them about the very needs of our campus and then we can brainstorm ways to, that they can help support. Um, you know, it's not always about resources and it's not always about money, but sometimes it's just about, you know, presence. You know, coming in, and, and if someone you know can come in and just work a lunch duty, or if somebody can come in and, and buy all the uniforms for every kid on the campus. Either way, they're adding value on, on our campus. And so, any any anyone that wants to help us fulfill our mission, um, by all means, reach out to uh, Shuli. And Shuli, I, I'm sure you'll post my information at some point somewhere. Um, okay. Reach out to me, and, and, and we can we can get it get it cracked. Okay, and we can do that right now. Go ahead, drop your email address, or would you like us to do? Would you like an inbox, and then I send it to them that way? That's fine. You can do. You can inbox it, but okay. I'll say real quick. It's m l b l a n d at garlandisd.net. I'm gonna drop it, and, and she's gonna do it the other way. All right. And you and you tell me if this is correct. Is this correct? That is correct. That is correct. Okay. So if you want to reach out to Principal Bland about strategy, if you want to provide support, if you have questions, I don't know about getting this school cracking and popping. If you have an idea about starting a school, I think that is an excellent idea um, for those educators and the people who have ideas. It's time for us to be, like you said, just say, forget the box. Let's be revolutionary during this time. Um, what, what grade levels are at your school? So we're sixth through eighth grade. Um, I've, I've worked high school campuses and I've worked, um, you know, middle school. So I've never done elementary. Uh, those primary years are, are, are critical. You know, we need to see more teachers of color on the uh, primary side, you know, first through fifth, pre-K through fifth. Uh, and as well as, as, you know, on the secondary side. But um, our kids, they start to lose momentum and they start to lose hope right around third and fourth grade. Um, they're no longer cute and cuddly and you can you know, put a bow in their hair and everybody just kind of melts. Um, they then become those students that they see uh, as being future whatever and those biases start to kick in and our kids just lose momentum. Yeah. So we need people that can see the worth in them. Okay, take us out, take us out. I believe that education uh, is a form of activism. Like you said, we need our own schools, we need our own banks. We need to have our own grocery stores to control mm -hmm. the food supply. We need to make sure like our money is right, that we're healthy, that we're good, that we have our doctors and our hospitals in our communities. And we can start by being 
active somehow, what are some steps or what are some things you can tell us? Top three things to be bold and courageous to let your voice be heard during a time like this so that we can really make some moves, like truly move needles. Right. That was the question, right? Yeah, that's your question. Yeah, so <laughs> it was loaded though. Right, so blow up the box, uh, be bold, and um, don't worry about the consequences. You know, in the short term, and so, and, and and also going back to the to the theme, solidarity in the face of adversity for a common cause. Support the people that support your children, and so that supports your community. Vote as well. Vote your interests, not not what's popular. Uh, vote in your uh, for, for not only in the national election but also your local elections, which are far more important. Uh, we have a historic uh, you know election coming up here this November. And uh, if we don't get out there and, and, and make our voice heard from that way, um, we're going to see more of what we're seeing right now, but on steroids. Indeed. All right. So she listed it for us. Blow up the box. Be bold. Don't worry about the consequences. If you want to reach out to Principal Bland, I happen to know that he does speak and he's happy to come and share his strategies with you and your organization. Thank you so much, Graham fam. Thank you so much, so much, so much. We needed this conversation. The conversation continues through you all. Go out and take the information that you learned here tonight. Share this and allow the information to just make this type of thing viral. People need to know about this. Share the conversation. Keep it going. Ask the right questions and take the information and the tools that he's given you and speak it in your own life. You all have a good night. Thank you.